to roll? I'm ready. Welcome to the show, everyone. This is exciting. I have not been releasing enough podcasts on a weekly basis, and I apologize for that. I actually had some sound issues and some files got corrupted. Anyway, long story, lots of excuses, but we're back on it. And today, I have a special guest. This guy has been cutting my hair for a while now. He is an all-around badass, and he's also known as Fussy Nate. So welcome to the show, Nate. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, I was sitting in our our bi-weekly, you know, haircuts, and we always have such interesting, in my opinion, conversations and discussions, so I felt like you should be on the show. Well, thanks. Right. Well, why don't you introduce yourself, and, um, and let's hear about who you are, and... Well, I go by Fuzzy Nate, but my name is actually Nathan Bush. Um, I'm from Southern California, living in Salt Lake City, Utah now. Um, years past, I haven't always been a barber. I've done everything from construction to... Um, corrections officer. I was a uh, pediatric respiratory therapist for 15 years and now I'm here married with three kids and loving life. Nice man. So like by the look of you, you know, you're all tatted up, mm -hmm. you know, you got you got your your beard going on and everything. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've always been, you know, into tattoos yeah. and beards and everything else? I got my first tattoo when I was 17. It's it's tribal on my back, so you know, I'm not super proud of it. <laughs> but uh, it's not like I, I I left healthcare and became a barber and got sleeved and grew a beard. No, I've I've had my my sleeves since I was oh god, probably 24, 25, and I'm 38 now. Mm -hmm. um, I've always had a beard. Maybe it's a little bit bigger now than it has in years past. But no, I've I've never fit the mold of white collar American worker. But as far as uh, as far as looks go, but it, like I said, I was fairly successful within the industry for 15 years. So yeah, that's what I want to dig in more into and really hear about. But tell me where where you raised. What is your story? What's your background? I was raised all over the United States of America. Um, my parents got divorced when I was six, and there was never a custody agreement. <clears throat> so I was I was born in Southern California in San Bernardino. Um, lived in LA County up till about 12 years old. My mom moved out of state. Um, she moved to Oregon, so I followed her up to Oregon, and my dad couldn't really contest it because there was no agreement. And then from Oregon, my stepdad's job moved us to upstate New York. I hated New York, so I moved back to California. Missed my mom, moved back to New York. My stepdad's job moved us to Kentucky. Missed my dad, so moved from Kentucky back to California. From California back, geez, I think. Wow. I think I went back to Indiana after that, which is right across the river from Kentucky. Then I was in the military for a few weeks in Texas. And back to California. And now here I am in Utah. Wow, that's a lot back and forth. Yeah, I think I did the math one day. I think I went to 21 different schools between elementary school and high school. How was that? I loved it. I got to restart every time I went to a new place. There, I mean, there's definitely some deficiencies that occurred in life because of it. I can count on one hand maybe people I know from my childhood that I've kept in touch with. Um, never played team sports, so the whole team aspect of life for me, it's been a challenge. Working in an environment where you have bosses, managers, stuff like that, it's just never made sense to me because I've always fought for myself and done what I needed to do for me. Mm -hmm. So there's there was a lot of great aspects to it. It taught me how to make new friends, how to adapt, but at the same token, uh, it probably stunted my growth in a lot of areas of life that are considered integral for professional relationships. Mm -hmm. So why did you stay in Utah? Uh, I actually moved out here when I was working, still working in healthcare. I, t I took a 90 day work contract um, and I had lived in big cities my whole life and my recruiter says Salt Lake City, Utah and I'm like, well, that seems small, let's go there. And uh, I came out here and I was here for three days and I remember calling my dad and saying, well, I live in Utah now. The, the people here, the atmosphere here is just, there's nothing else like it in the places I've lived in the United States. I tell people Salt Lake City is big enough to be a city, but small enough to be a town. Mm. So there's, 
the difference is in San Diego, um, everybody commutes to work. So you go do your job, and then you go home and live your life. And when you're at work, you don't really care. You're just thinking about going home. Well, people here in Salt Lake, when they do their work, they're taking care of their neighbors, their brothers, cousins, sisters, and everybody's twice removed some way, shape, or form. Everybody knows everybody here. Mm -hmm. Small Lake City. It's small Lake City, absolutely. <laughs> so there's a personal reflection on what everybody does around here, and yeah. it's super nice. Mm -hmm. I love it here. And, you know, the, the views, the mountains, everything like that, I couldn't pass that up. I, I so agree with you. I, I'm, a, I'm a transplant, too, you know, and so, like, everything you're saying is exactly right. It's just you hear so often people, you know, down-talking Salt Lake because of the the cultural aspects of the religion mm -hmm. that's in charge here. <laughs> you know, I'll know. tell you what I tell those people. Yeah, Salt Lake fucking sucks. Don't look here. <laughs> Stay away. Stay away. Yeah, go, to yeah. go to Colorado. Go to Colorado. Let's go to Denver. Fun. Something like that. Portland. Our liquor war sucks. You don't yeah. want to be Life here. Life is horrible here. Oh my yeah. goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I say the same thing. But it's right. You know, you like you have the mountains here. You have the accessibility of everything. But so coming from, from where you came from and coming into this culture, like you just had a good experience? Are you, you're referencing the influence of the Mormon church? Yeah, not so much the Mormon church, it's more the, the culture that creates here, right? Because if you come in with tattoos, and like you look different here, you know? Like there is there's yeah. some stigma yeah, around absolutely. that. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think when I first moved here, I think it was about 12 years ago, it was a little bit more prevalent then. Being a heavily tattooed person in a highly conservative work environment, mm -hmm. I stuck out. But the funny part is, I worked at Starbucks in 2001 back in California and was required to cover all my tattoos. Mm -hmm. In 2006, I believe, is when I moved out here and go work at a corporate hospital, and the hospital policy just said they had to be tasteful. So, um, you know, I don't have any demonic stuff or nude pictures on any visible parts of my body that kids could see. So, I, I mean, I know, what I, I know what I look like when I walk into a room. So working in healthcare, I expected to be judged. So what I've always told the kids that I worked with when they say, oh, I wanna get tattoos, and I wanna do this, and I wanna do that, I tell them to choose their career first, okay? Get into that career, I define who you are, be successful in that, and then alter that if you wanna, if you wanna get tattooed after that, so be it. Because I tell them the struggles that I have is it doesn't matter if I'm the best at what I do. When I would walk into a hospital room, all people would see is my tattoos. So I couldn't just be the best. I had to be better. Mm -hmm. I had to allow my actions and my expertise in my profession to speak louder than my image. Mm -hmm. And that actually took me a lot of places. Um, and I credit that to probably my incredibly conservative father who's a contractor and just taught me if you're ever going to do anything, do it to your fullest potential. Oh, I like that. So talk to us, would you take that and apply that into what you did? So tell us about your career, basically. So My like, current one? Or no, like the, the past, like how did, you, <laughs> how did you end up a barber, I guess, my question. All right, so we'll go, you know, I mentioned construction and stuff like that. That was definitely younger years in life, odd jobs here and there, I've had a ton of them. My first real job where I actually lasted, I was a crackers officer for a few years in, Cal okay. or in Texas. In Texas? Yep. And I I wanted to venture into law enforcement, so I wanted to be back closer to home. I had applications in, in California to um, work for LA County Sheriff's Department and for California Department of Corrections. And I, I was young and naive. I thought I was so far along in the process, how could they turn me down? So I moved back home and got denied both those positions. Uh, getting into law enforcement is not an easy process. Mm. So at any rate, Suddenly, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And one of the gyms I worked out with, there was a guy there who was a respiratory therapist, and this guy was jacked, man. And he told me, oh, you should look into respiratory therapy. I had no clue what it was. So I went to basically, I, I, I got online, I Google searched it. Next thing you know, I'm at a trade school, one of those, get your associates in 18 months, and you can be working and making this much money. Well, I, I signed up. I did it. Still didn't have a clue what a story therapist was. <laughs> but I just didn't want to stagnate in life. And you're like, he was jacked and he looked happy, so I'm going to go that route. Yeah, bottom line, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, I found out what it was after getting my associate's degree, passing my state boards, doing my clinicals and stuff like that. And in that career, I just started at the bottom. Um, I worked for a year when I graduated up in Central California in Fresno. 
and my brother lived in San Diego. I moved down to San Diego. I worked for a, a year in the adult hospital there. And then one of my buddies asked me to come work in the labor and delivery in NICU that he managed, and I, I didn't want to do it. And he said he was struggling to find qualified staff, and he just needs somebody he could trust. And I said, sure, screw it, I'll go do it. And I did it, and then the very first time that I went to a delivery on my own and helped out this poor innocent kid that didn't deserve to be in the situation he was in. He didn't do anything wrong. I realized I didn't want to work with adults anymore. Mm. So I, I focused my attention on uh, on pediatrics at that point in time and went full-time in pediatrics and uh, after doing that for a few years I ended up deciding that San Diego just wasn't where I saw my life so I took the contract wait, wait, wait. that's something that most people would say blasphemy <laughs> everybody I know wants to go to freaking San Diego <laughs> yeah go there go there visit there try try to live there it's it's a whole nother story trying to live there um, sorry Oh, it's, it's, good. Enjoy it's that, right? fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I moved up to Salt Lake, and then for the first time ever, I was I was being permanent at a location. So working at the hospital here for kids, I started to move my way up and uh, take on different opportunities and responsibilities. I flew with Life Light for a little while. Um, I got recruited by a couple of law firms um, here on the west western side of the United States to become an expert legal witness for malpractice lawsuits. Um, just kind of did everything I could within the profession. And I correlate it to when Affordable Health Care Act was passed. The dynamic of the hospital changed overnight. I've always known hospitals were out to make money. Mm -hmm. There's, We all know that. Hospitals are a business. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt like as a bedside caregiver, I was always afforded the resources, time, and opportunity to still do my job right. Well, when the Affordable Health Care Act passed, standardized billing and everything like that, hospitals now are suddenly going, how are we going to continue to be compensated and, and continue to make the margins that we've been making if we can't bill as much? So what they did is they started, they started cutting, in my opinion, um, cutting down on how much they were paying qualified people. So not that we got a pay deduction, they just started looking for new grads as opposed to qualified people to come on board because they could pay them substantially less an hour. And then the other way was, <clears throat> instead of you know maybe giving you 20 things to do in a shift, they give you 25 things to do in a shift. So getting 13 hours of work out of a 12 hour shift. And when you couple those two things together, it becomes sketchy. Um, I would never badmouth the hospital I worked at. I would take my kids there in a heartbeat. My wife still works there. Great hospital, but seeing that paradigm shift, it wasn't something I could be a part of. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like I couldn't do my job to my full, full potential. And I had three night shifts in a row, and I lost a patient each shift. And not being cryptic, the patients died. These are young children. And you combine that with just the emotion of having to do CPR on a child to eventually not be successful, mm -hmm. lack of resources, and just one right after another, it's, it seemed like overnight I developed this case of PTSD. Okay. I woke up one morning, I told my wife, I can't go back. Mm. I can't do it. I cannot do this. And she said, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't have a freaking clue. And so I talked to Human Resources, and Human Resources heard what I had to say, and they're like, you know, we'll give you 90 days paid off, and uh, just go figure out life. So in that time frame, I had wanted to cut hair when I was when I was a senior in high school, but back in the early 90s, the only people who were cutting hair were gay men. <laughs> and my family, being more on the conservative side of things, they didn't tell me no, but uh, I could tell they weren't too enthused about the idea. Mm -hmm. So we're in a different path in life, and after taking that time off from the hospital, I finally came home and told my wife, I said, I'm going to open a barbershop. She said, you're going to what? And I said, here's, here's my plan, this is what I'm going to do, this is how much I think it's going to cost, and I'm going to go for it. And she says, you've never let us down, go for it. Wow. So uh, that was, I opened the shop three years ago last month. Yeah. And you're doing really well. Uh, getting ready to expand, actually. Yeah. I've, I mean, I'm not 100% booked, but I am turning away 
customers and I'm opening up a new location that has more square footage so I can bring in more barbers to help with the growth of the shop. And that's incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm really interested in, you know, is the, is the mind, the decision making process in all this, right? Because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people and I know a lot of our listeners and you do too, who feel the same way you do about their corporate job, right? They can't do it anymore in their head, but they mm -hmm. keep on going because there's a codependent relationship with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And there are all these fears build up about, you know, doing something different, never get to explore themselves. Mm -hmm. What do you think makes your mindset different? You know, I could say all kinds of great phrases and give all kinds of encouraging words and how to do it, but I think ultimately my mindset was different because it was out of sheer frustration and I've just got balls that are bigger than some other people. <laughs> um, to, to make that change, you got to have balls. I had a mortgage, I've got three kids and a wife who are depending on me. And to walk away from a steady paycheck with the golden handcuffs, the 401k, the paid time off, the sick leave, the disability and all that stuff, and just go, fuck it, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. you got to have balls to do that. But it can't be blind faith. You can't be an idiot. Mm -hmm. There's no point in doing that if you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. I didn't just wake up one day and decide to do this without a plan. I had written down a business plan. I had determined the financing it would take to uh, open the shop. I determined how much it would cost on my monthly expenses while I was in school to provide for my family, how much money I had in the bank. Uh, anybody who thinks that they can start a business and be successful without capital in my mind is somewhat foolish. Mm -hmm. Now you don't need a half million dollars. I probably did it with I think I opened my shop for less than 10 grand. I financed my training, which is now a tax deduction, and I had about 20 grand in a 401k that I closed out to subsidize my income while I wasn't drawing an income for six months. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we weren't going out to dinner. We weren't going on vacation. And um, we just lived tight and started networking while I was in school, started marketing myself while I was in school, and I had clientele built up before I graduated. So do you, that mindset, do you think that's learned behavior from you moving around so much, being resilient to change, right? And just having a complete faith in yourself and your decision-making process? Or what do you think it is? Because, you know, you, you can have people who are who have balls, but still mm -hmm. are not willing to, you know, compromise in their current situation. Mm -hmm. When you say I have complete faith in myself, that's not accurate. There's still to this day, there's not a day that goes by where I'm not worried about business failing. Mm -hmm. um, there was a shit ton of doubt, but the desire to change, the desire to smile more, the desire for happiness far exceeded the desire of the dollar. Mm -hmm. um, I knew there was a potential to make money, but you know that's not what drove it. And as far as my past and moving around, maybe it did play factor in it um, that I've never really given a second thought about. But. Um, Bottom line, I, I didn't think about any of those things. I thought about who I was as a person after working 15 years in corporate America and healthcare, and I didn't like that person. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like that person so much, I didn't want to be that person anymore. Mm -hmm. And instead of saying, I don't want to be that person, I just stopped being that person and, and became somebody else. I was embittered, I drank excessively, um, I was not a good husband, I was, I was not a good father, I just, you know, people would look at you and say, yeah, you're a great guy, you do all these great things. I wasn't, though. Mm -hmm. I, I was going through the motions. I was waking up because I was supposed to wake up at that time. I was going to the job that I was supposed to go to because I had a degree for that job. Came home to the house that I was paying for to my wife and my kids because that's what I was supposed to do, not because I wanted to do it. I had to change the mindset of living a life that I wanted to live, mm -hmm. not a life that I had just ended up in and didn't know how to get out of. Mm -hmm. That's deep. But yeah. that's also really interesting. And that's, um, I, as you were talking, the reason why I'm quiet is because I'm kind of, I'm kind of taking that on to my own life. You know, like when I was a kid too, we, we moved around a lot. You know, my dad was an alcoholic. Like I became very resilient to change too. I restarted my life three times. You know, I packed two suitcases, came to America. And the one thing that people always ask me when every time I restarted my life and I made a decision is like, well, how did you dare to do that? You know, how'd you dare to buy a gym, for example, right? How'd you dare to move to America, right? Like, 
how did you dare to do all these things? I'm like, I never thought about yeah. failure. A absolutely. When yeah. it feels right and being able to tap into that, I'm like, okay, well then there, there is, okay, we gotta be calculated about it, of course, but like I'm choosing to do something that I feel like is right. Mm -hmm. the, the thought process of that it's right for you is greater than the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't ever pretend that failure is not an option but the big picture for you, it sounds like, is, is much like myself, we're more focused on the success that's mm -hmm. possible, not the failure that's possible. Yeah. You know, I, like I said earlier, there's not a day that goes by that I don't worry about business continuing to be productive and be successful. Well, I could let that be paralyzing. Mm -hmm. Or I can continue to strive to give my customers what they want, continue to try to, to have a great business and develop relationships with people and continue to grow. Um, and that's what I choose to do. I don't pretend that failure isn't an option. I know it's an option. I know it's possible. But I just tend to focus on the success of it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's so cool because like it's, it, in The Alchemist, the book The Alchemist, they describe this too as finding you know, your, the quest of your life. Mm -hmm. right? Not purpose, but the quest. What is the quest going to look like? It's not something that's you know, allocated into certain time slots in your life of saying, okay, well now I'm going to be a father, I'm going to have kids mm -hmm. and this is like, what is it that's gonna be deep and meaningful and purposeful for you for the rest of your life, right? Absolutely. Being able to tap into that, and that's something that I felt too, and I really I really started nailing when I started becoming a personal trainer, and then involving the coaching aspect, and now into like just, you know, being in fully business and life coaching is where I feel like I feel so lucky to be able to do that because I feel like it's what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. It's my quest in life, I'm supposed to do this the rest of my life, you know? And so for you being able to tap into that as well, and you're cutting hair, but it's not about the cutting hair for you, is it? No, no, I, I tell people all the time, a good barber doesn't have to be good at cutting hair. You gotta mm -hmm. be okay at it. And that's my shop's slogan. I tell people I'm Salt Lake's most okayest barber. <laughs> um, look, my customers come back to me because apparently I do somewhat of a good job. I cut your hair, you like the haircut, you come back to me. But you could get that anywhere. You can get a decent haircut at plenty of places anywhere in the United States of America. What you can't get is personal relationships anymore. They're, they're on the way out the door. You, you look at everybody out in society these days and they're buried face down in the, the screen of their phone. If I have to take a phone call in the middle of a haircut, which I try not to do, I ask the customer if it's all right if I take it because it's our time together. And, and the reason that that happens is because there's a personal respect in my shop. I respect them, they respect me, and I don't have, I refer to them as customers, I don't have customers. I've got like 500 really great friends. Mm -hmm. And I and I see them that way. Their time is important to me, my time is important to them. I'm curious about their life, they're curious about mine. Um, like, like I said, you know, I feel like probably 60% of being a barber is cutting hair, and the other 40% is relating with your customers. Mm -hmm. And because I've had so much life experience that's led me up to where I am right now, I feel like I can relate in some way, shape, and form to every person who comes through that door. And I allow myself to be vulnerable with them. And it's not like this tactical move. I'm not being vulnerable with them to get them to be vulnerable with me. We're just two people having a conversation, talking about the frustrations in life, the joys of our life, the plans for our life, and the, and the great part is I get to know these guys, so I'll have somebody come in and say, yeah, I'm really thinking about, you know, maybe applying for a new job or doing this or doing that, and it's, great, John Smith, uh, I'll be cutting your hair in three weeks, and I want you to tell me which jobs you apply for before you come back. And they come back, and they're like, hey, I applied for this job, that job, or this job, or they hang their head low, but they still come back, and they're like, man, I just don't have enough balls to do it, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. And I can ask them just simple questions, like, why are you scared? I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a life coach. They're just questions of me as an individual, interested in them as an individual that come to mind. Mm -hmm. The who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, I've got a young man who's been coming to me now for about a year, and he told me since he, I've been cutting his hair, he's been motivated to take a promotion at work. He's lost 65 pounds, and he has his first girlfriend ever. Wow. And he's like, yeah, just, you know, you cut my hair has given me confidence. And I, I don't agree with that. I think me treating him the way he needs to be treated as an individual and looking at this guy who is sitting in my chair being vulnerable and going, you know what, this guy needs encouragement. And offering him a few words of encouragement 
he's been isolated for so long because he's you know how self conscious about the way he looks and stuff like that to have just a neutral guy who looks like myself who I'm the guy that should be bullying him I'm the guy who should be making fun of him instead of that I'm looking at him and saying dude I've got faith in you you can do more you can do better I think you're selling yourself short mm -hmm. and he goes out and does better and tells me about it and. You know, like, like I said, I think that's part of the success of my shop is we are all real with each other. I don't have a single customer that comes into my shop and just sits there and doesn't say a word. We all open up to each other in some way, shape, or form. You and I have had plenty of in-depth conversations about stuff I've gone through in my life and stuff you've gone through in your life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've got a customer who, his goal is to run for president of the United States of America. And he goes, the only thing I ever have to worry about is them coming to you and vetting me because I know all the secrets and then he pauses and he goes you know what actually you're the one person in this world who would never sell me out <laughs> and he's and it's true because it's there's there's just a confidentiality that mm -hmm. occurs there yeah it's interesting you say that because like that that's where I feel like my job as well that's why I love it so much is because you get to see the beauty of life basically you get to see people real authentic vulnerable you know with all their shit you know, you get to see everything. And for me, that's so beautiful to see all the imperfections. Mm -hmm. But then it's true. And, you know, you bring up social media, you bring up the internet in general, and there are people's phones and being buried in this, like, almost fake world. Absolutely. Right? Where they put up, you know, a, a perfect picture, and they try, and they think that that's real life, but they can't deal with their own struggles. So having somebody just sit down and actually just listen to them and talk and make them feel safe, it is something that is so rare these days, and people just want to be mm -hmm. listened to. Or they think that no matter what they accomplish, when they compare it to the people they follow on social media, they're still not accomplishing anything. Mm -hmm. And it's not true, man. We all weren't meant to be Nicholson. We all weren't meant to be Fuzzy Nate. We weren't all meant to be billionaires. But we're all capable of accomplishing something. Mm -hmm. And we all get excited when we accomplish something. When, when you were doing IFBB Pro and stuff like that, when you would come in first place in a competition or something like that. That was an accomplishment for you. You'd get excited about that. But then you could very easily look at somebody who is on a level higher than you and see what they accomplished and dilute what you had just achieved. And and I just won't allow that in the people I'm friends with in my, in, in my shop. I just will not allow them to dilute their, themselves. And as long as they're vulnerable with me, I'll be vulnerable with them and we mm -hmm. talk real. So the comparison aspect of it. Yeah, absolutely. So well, how do you do that? So you, how many kids do you have? I think I have three. You think so? Three <laughs> that you're responsible for? <laughs> yeah, three that I know of. <laughs> and so how do you teach these principles to your children? Hell, if I had the answer to that, I'd write a book. <laughs> how um, do you try to do it? How do you try to install those values in them? I question my tactics as a parent every day. That's how. I never become complacent in the way that I'm raising the kids and feel like I'm doing it right. Okay. I've had struggles beyond belief. I've got a 13-year-old, an almost 12-year-old, and a 9-year-old. Mm -hmm. and, um, and every day is different. I want every day, but fall short every day, to encourage my children. I start off every day hoping that I can speak positivity into their life, that I can educate them, teach them how to make decisions, um, and be positive and encouraging throughout the whole process. But parenting is frustrating. Mm -hmm. Anybody who says different is on a shit ton of drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and I fail. I fail at every every day. I over-criticize. I take jabs. I micromanage. These are my shortcomings that I, that I go through. And guess what? I don't wake up the next day and go, well, I've still got to be that person because that's who I am. No, I work on correcting it again and again and again and again. But ultimately... What I am trying to accomplish in my children's lives is how to teach them to be self-sufficient individuals. Mm. I don't want to raise my kids up to the age of 18, telling them to take a shower every day, telling them to wash their hands after they take a piss, to do their laundry, to clean the room, and then just pray to God that it sticks when they turn 18 and move out the door, if that's what they choose to do. I want to see the examples of them being able to do that now, at their current age, so I can re give them little reminders and get them to be more productive and self-sufficient now as kids. Um, there's not a single one of my kiddos who's not capable of getting themselves ready for school in the morning, grabbing a bowl of cereal, doing dishes, working the washing machine, dryer, vacuum cleaner, anything like that. They all know how to do that. And I expect them to do it. 
My kids are my slaves. I don't expect my kids to clean up after me. We have two rules in our house. Clean up after yourself and be honest. Uh, honesty is, is much higher than clean up after yourself. But as far as chores go, it's just clean up after yourself. My nine-year-old daughter woke up the other morning and she was struggling getting ready for school. And I asked her, I said, what's taking so long? Excuse me, I'm drinking whiskey. <laughs> and uh, she says, Dad, I don't have any clean clothes to wear. And I said, well, what should you do? And she goes, well, I guess I should start a load of laundry. Most nine-year-olds, unfortunately, these days couldn't figure that out. They can't figure out the A, B, and C of life. So the fact that she didn't have any clean clothes to wear and waited too long, was it frustrating? Yeah. But I can guarantee that that's probably going to be the last of a very few times that she's going to forget to wash clothes. Mm -hmm. She'll look in her closet the day before and go, crap, I don't have any clothes to wear. Mm -hmm. And she washes her own clothes. I remind her to put them in the dryer, and I remind her to put them away. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked before about you know you're making a career s shift as well for your family's sake, right? So they have more. You could be a father. You mm -hmm. could be there for your children. Like you were in control of your schedule. It's the freedom aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So what what do you feel like that transition has done for your life into going from that corporate controlled environment to having the complete freedom of running your own business? How's that affect your family? I don't bring the bullshit at work home because there is no bullshit at work anymore. I'm not pissed because my annual review told me that my clothes weren't bleached wide enough and that I offended Susie Q. Smith because I said the F word at work. I don't bring those fears and that anger home with me every day. I'm happy to wake up in the morning and go do my job and I'm happy to come home and do that job when I come home of being the father and the husband. Unfortunately, I think corporate America has put into our minds it has groomed us to be insecure. Every year you've got to go in front of your boss for your annual review to justify why you should get a raise. That boss's job isn't to tell you what a great job you've been doing. His job's to tell you what you've been doing wrong. So every year you got to bend over and let some stranger fuck you in the ass and tell you he's going to give you a 1% raise when you've been busting your ass all year and really, on paper, you probably earn the, the place you're working for tens if not hundreds of thousands of more dollars and you're going to make an extra $750 in that upcoming year. And, and then you got to go to work the next day and you got to worry about who you're going to piss off if you're doing your job good enough to maybe get a 2% raise next year. And every day that builds up on your shoulders and you bring that home with you. You bring home those insecurities. You bring home those frustrations. Whether you want to admit it or not, you bring it home. And you take that out on the people that you're close to. Not because you want to, not because you're a bad person, because you do. It's, there's no arguing the fact. If you went out and got in an accident at the end of the street and you know the kids were home alone and you just, you know, for whatever reason, walked home, you're going to be visibly upset it is going to affect the way you interact with your kids. Not because you want that car accident to interact, or if, to affect the way you interact with your kids. It's just the fact of life, it's going to. It is life. We bring <clears throat> all of our experiences and everything that occurs in our lives, and it affects who we are with the people in our lives. And I, don't, I just eliminated that shit. Mm -hmm. So what, what has it given you as a person to be able to do that and be there? I know a lot that you lost a lot of hair over it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a whole lot of hair to begin with. But what, what, did, what did you gain from it? Like, what does it mean to you be, 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 be there to tell you, to coach your daughter into figuring out why it's important to wash her clothes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think before I didn't really care. Mm. I, I think before it was task oriented. Parenting was task oriented. Um, Marriage was a business partnership. It was a list of things that had to be achieved. And now, because I don't have those burdens on my shoulder at least 40 hours a week, it's more of just out of personal interest. Like the same interest I have for my clients, I now have that interest for every person I meet in life, including my wife and my kids. Mm -hmm. The reason I interact with my kids is not because I want the house clean, not because I want them to clean up after themselves. It's because I want them to know how to take care of themselves. And they are our future. And I can...
belittle them, I can run them down just like a corporate job would do or had done to me, or I can build them up. And now that I am not constantly being ran down into the ground in my own work life, I have more energy to build the people up that are around me, mm -hmm. including my wife and my kids. I like that. I think what you're talking about, and this is something I experienced too, is ownership. Because I know that when I was in a corporate environment and I knew, okay, I had a paycheck flowing in you know, every single month, I didn't have to own that. I just had to show up to work and that yeah. was it. You didn't yeah, have absolutely. to own how much, you know, how much I was going to make or the effort I put in. I was just going to get through, right? So I didn't have to own that aspect. Everything was outsourced. So everything else in my life was lived the same way, basically. So I feel like what I learned in my life being going into being an entrepreneur is just fucking ownership of every single thing that happens in your life because you are mm -hmm. in full, complete ownership of your life. Everything that happens is your fault. That's best as an entrepreneur, but it's not like that when you have a corporate mentality. You take a different hat on every morning when you wake up, mm -hmm. right? So is that what you kind of like the essence of what you're talking about? Sure. <laughs> you know, I like like I said, I've never people have asked me to explain entrepreneurship, why my business is successful. They look at my life and think my life is successful, and I've never been able to quantify it. Mm -hmm. So when you when you say that, putting putting words to it, yeah, I, I think not ownership and just like your day-to-day -day tasks, but taking ownership of your life. Mm -hmm. Taking ownership of, you know what, today I woke up and I am choosing to be happy today. Mm -hmm. I am choosing to go to work today. Not because I have to, because I want to, because I chose this life. So taking ownership over all of that, which means I guess in one way of realizing you have choices and making those choices and then taking ownership of those choices. Mm -hmm. Um, I woke up the other day and I was in a shitty mood. Guess what? Took ownership of it. Yeah. Told my wife, I am in a shitty mood and I don't know why. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like when you work in a corporate job and you felt a little sick. Oh yeah, I'm sick today. Well, you don't work by yourself. You're not, I'm not sick. If I'm, if I'm homesick, it's because I'm really, really, really sick. There's I've taken ownership. two days <laughs> off of work in three years. Isn't that incredible? Where at my last job, I took off probably two to three weeks worth of sick leave every year. Mm -hmm and was constantly in trouble for taking off too many days. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, okay, so that, that's, that's an interesting thing. Did you actually convince yourself you were sick enough and, or was it just like, okay, well, cause I can? No, I wasn't sick at all. Maybe, maybe I was, maybe I was hung over. But ultimately <laughs> what it came down, down to was the desire to not be at work was greater than the desire to be mm -hmm. at work. Yeah. Um, my desire now is greater to be at work than it is to be at home. Mm -hmm. Work is still an obligation, don't get me wrong. Um, yeah, I still have to commit to doing these things. I don't just get to open a business and then go, oh, look, paychecks. Woo! Mm -hmm. I still have to work for it. Yeah. But I want to. Mm -hmm. It's And it's not because I have to. It's because I choose to. Mm -hmm. And I love it. Yeah. That's cool. Like, what I experienced with that, too, is this, like, the ownership, you know, creates this humble nature inside of me. To where when I know I own something and I'm the catalyst to make that happen in my life, which means I can turn it off and I want to be a better dad. Well, I can I can turn that off because I, I yeah. own that, right? Everything's my fault if I'm not, mm -hmm. relationship-wise, you know, but also work-wise. I have to turn it on off. It's my ownership of that, right? And so that that's that's how I feel about it. Like it's just it's it's the it's the complete ownership that just that just generates that feeling. Yeah, and and I guess you we, we could compare that to what I said about the annual review from your boss. We do our review every morning in the mirror, in the bathroom. The person that we're looking at, are we happy with the direction the day is going, the direction the business is going, the direction your relationship with your children, your significant others are going? We evaluate that every day. We have that evaluation. We take ownership of where it's at and how to change it. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you know, you're working those 40 hours a week for the corporation, the ownership's taken away from you. Yeah. Somebody else is telling you who you are is or is not good enough. They are telling you the steps you need to take to make it better or to dial it back. They tie your hands and they beat us down. Now, it's not their fault. We have a, given them that power. Mm -hmm. We have chosen to be in that position and to become a subordinate to that person. But unfortunately, it directs us in such a path that making that decision to not be a subordinate and to take ownership for your life becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's why when you asked me at the beginning what 
about my history would make me more able to be different and, and choose a different path, rewrite life, go different directions than somebody else. I think ultimately, you know, maybe moving around so much and not buying into the social norms of I need to be in this group, the football captain is the guy that I gotta ask if I can do this or do that. I just never fell into that. Mm -hmm. I never really fucking gave a shit. Yeah. I, I want you to be my friend. I don't need you to be my friend. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to like me. I don't need you to like me. Mm -hmm. and, and really, that's not out of arrogance. My heart breaks when somebody doesn't like who I am as a person. It affects me deeply. I come across as confi cocky and ar arrogant. No, I'm not. I'm insecure. Mm -hmm. And my insecurities come across as cockiness and arrogance. It's a way to take control of my insecurities. Um, but I never bought into those social norms. I was always willing to look at those people and go, who the fuck are you? You are not the person that defines me. Mm -hmm. I am the person that defines me. And I've had plenty of instances, instances in life where people tried to beat me down, told me I can't do something, told me I'm incapable of doing something. And just the difference between me and a lot of other folks is I, I don't take that as discouragement. Yeah, it hurts, and I feel discouraged, but ultimately, when I process it all, it comes out as encouragement. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know what, fuck you. No, I'm gonna achieve it. That, that kind of confidence and ownership of who you are and being able to decide between like, what is a want and what is a need and not really needing other people's validation, do you think that that's something that can be taught or do you think there's something you're born with or do you think it's your upbringing? Like, what do you think, where do you think that comes from? God, that is a great question. Um, I think, I think we are all dynamic beings. I don't think any of our lives are pre-written, pre-ordained. I think any of us can learn something new and can become something different. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. We all have different personalities. I think that not looking for validation in others can definitely be taught, but then the question is who teaches you? Are you looking for validation in the person who's teaching you? So have you stopped looking for validation in others? Um, it's a great question. I, I don't, I don't I think, know. Have for, you seen the movie Office Space? No. You gotta watch the movie. The main character there, I, I swear, has gone through what I, I went through. He's punching a time clock at a cubicle. He's, his company's job is to get computer software ready for the Y2K turnover because the world was gonna end. Mm -hmm. And. He hates his job. And one day, he just stops giving a fuck. And the more he stops caring, the more he gets promoted, <laughs> the more money he makes, because he's this forward-thinking guy that has stopped living under other people's expectations of him. And he's just saying, you know what? No, I'm going to do what's right for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to deal with whatever comes along with it. Yeah. He looks at his house and goes, who cares? Mm -hmm. I got it today. We'll worry about tomorrow and tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so yeah, I don't know if it's just a breaking point that gets people to think that way or if it can be taught. Yeah, I don't know either. It's, it's, it's an interesting, it's actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Because it's like this whole thing of the more I learn about life, like I've finished 62 books this year so mm -hmm. far, right? The more I know, the more I learn, the, the less I know. So you're bragging. I'm illiterate. I can't No, read. I'm not bragging. I'm, I'm trying to crack the code of fucking life, you know? So I'm like, I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn. And the more I learn, the less I know. Right. And for me, that feels really good because then I can just surrender it to experience of life because life will happen, you know? It's, for me, it's like doing an audit. How does my life respond to me? I don't give a shit what people think about me. I really don't. I care about how, how life responds to me. So if I, you know, have, you know, loveless relationship around me or people just walk away from me, okay, well, that's not how I want life to respond to me. But that doesn't mean I give a shit about what they think about me. Mm -hmm. I, care, I only care about how my life responds to me. So being sitting down and really doing an audit of that mm -hmm. and saying, okay, well, where do I have to change my behavior in order for, my, for life to respond the way I want it to? Now, that is ownership because that's within my control. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Where I see a lot of people is that here's the difference is that, they, they give other people their, their power, right? right? They give their work their power. They give away their power to their, their spouses, their kids, and everybody else. And they just sit there, and they're a shell of nothing. I really, I really firmly believe that it can be taught if you learn how to own your life. If you, if you learn how to reclaim your power and you get to feel that inside of you, I've seen that multiple clients where they start coming alive, where they start owning themselves and they start owning their life again, they get that empowerment inside of them. And all of a sudden, it's like, kind of like the movie described, 
like fuck the world, right? You know, but not fuck the world. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, and the other thing is, let's let's go back and talk about the people who do work in and a forty hour work week, sixty hour work week, whatever a career, a mm -hmm. career based, not an entrepreneurial mind mindset. There has never been a point in my life where I'm saying that's wrong. I am not saying that's wrong at all. We need those people out there. There are so many different people behind doors, behind the curtains that we don't see. Um, all the way from the guys who manage the Starbucks store to get your coffee every morning, the person who orders the gas uh, that goes to the gas station where you pump your car. Those, if, if everybody had this entrepreneurial mindset, those people wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. But I think ultimately is how do you feel fulfilled in that? How are you able to wake up and go? We're, we're not saying happiness is defined by starting your own company and being successful in that company. We're saying this is how do you wake up, look in the mirror in the morning, and feel successful as an individual, as a human being, and like who you see and like your life and like the way the world's responding around you. Absolutely. Yeah. And who gets to set those success criteria for you? Is it Hollywood? Is it the tabloids? Is it Instagram models? Like who owns those success criteria of what success is supposed to look like in your own life? Mm -hmm. Is that an intrinsic journey for yourself, or are you, you know, giving giving the world the power to determine that for you, so you're never going to feel like you're enough? I think a better way to maybe you said, are you giving the world um, these powers to make that decision? I think maybe a better way to approach that is is. Are you passively allowing these things the power to become Absolutely. that? Because I don't think any of us, I, I don't think the vast majority of us stop and think, who are we giving the power to? It's this passive process. Mm -hmm. You wake up after 20 years of being married to a bitch who's beat you down every single day, told you you're worthless, doesn't put out, and fucking hate life, and you snap and say, I want a divorce and go a different. You didn't choose to give her that power. You passive, you were passive. Mm -hmm. And at some point in time, you chose to not give her that power. So I, I think ultimately it's not necessarily teaching people how to not look for approval on those things, but it's trying to give people the power to take control of who or what they give the power to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to affect who they are. Yeah. That, did that come out right? Oh, it okay. came out perfectly. Because it, it, it exposes the next issue that, that and I, well, I'm saying all these things because for you guys listening, if you're following along with this and you start recognizing yourself in this, then it's, it's really important to be able to identify where you're at in that journey and what, what's the next step if you do desire a change. Because like Nate said, you know, it's not, it's not that nine to five is bad in yeah. any way. It's just about are you fulfilled and you're happy within that. So if you don't want something, change it. And Stop what's bitching not, about it. What's not fulfilling and yeah. what's not happy. Exactly. Stop bitching about it. And do something about and it. And do something about it. Yeah, I, I was engaged years ago to to um, another nurse. Apparently, I like nurses. <laughs> Who doesn't? And right, <laughs> and this young woman, she um, she was great at her job, phenomenal at her job, and she came home every day beat down and frustrated. And I asked her, you know, what's going on? Well, they over, they they understaffed today. I had to take on this many patients. This happened. This doctor talked to me this way. This happened. This happened. This happened. And I look at her one day and I said, what'd you do to change that? Well, nothing. And that was cyclical. She didn't feel she had a voice. She didn't feel confident enough in who she was to speak up. So finally one day she came home and tells me the same song and dance over and over again. And I said, look, I love you. But stop coming to me with your problems if you're not willing to take control of them. I said, very simply... All it takes is for you speaking up, going to your manager and saying, this is not acceptable, it's dangerous, and I don't feel comfortable working in this environment. Things need to change. And that starts a pendulum swinging in a different direction. Now you've tried. You're attempting to take control of the things that are not making you happy. Stop identifying what's not making you happy and then continuing to identify what's not making you happy day and day and day again. Identify what it's going to take to change the things that aren't making you happy. And it, it could start with something small. It could start with something incredibly small. I don't like the way I look in these glasses. Cool. So I don't necessarily have to go out today and buy a new pair of glasses because it's a process. We've got to find a doctor. We've got to find the glasses we like. So how do we start to change those things? I pick up the phone and call an optometrist to make an appointment. Step one. It doesn't have to be changed today. And then you follow through with it. You don't wake up and go, my life sucks. How do I change my life? 
That's a very broad question. You wake up and go, what don't I currently like about my life? All right, ponder that for a few seconds. I want to lose 10 pounds. I don't like the car I drive. I don't like my job. Those are all accomplishable tasks if you take them on systematically and one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. If you just go, I don't like the way I look, I hate my life, this, that, this, and that, you haven't pinpointed anything. And because you're throwing a broad net, you cannot identify a single problem, which requires an, indi an individual thought process for that problem to create change. Mm -hmm. So it's individualizing the problems, identifying them, and identifying what works best for you to change them. That's all there is to it. There you go. And then not being paralyzed by the fear of failure. Because there is no failing unless you yeah. stop. I'll tell you what, man. The first time you stand up to your boss and walk in there and say, you know what, I want to race. You're going to pop a boner. Whether you succeed at it or not, the fact that you accomplished something, that for you, now maybe you didn't accomplish getting the race, but you told yourself you were going to do this and you had enough faith in yourself to follow through with it, man, that is empowering. Mm -hmm. And that is step number one to changing a thousand other things. Mm -hmm. Like I get customers all the time that are single guys, whatever, they come in and they say, man, I went out last night after you cut my hair. I met this girl, this, that, this, and that. Man, your haircut did this. My haircut didn't do shit. <laughs> the fact that I gave you a decent haircut and you had confidence when you left is what gave you that. I, I wasn't there talking in their ear. That girl didn't look at that guy and go, wow, I really want to give him my wet panties right now because he's got a great haircut. That guy, because we, we all know girls don't work that way. Mm -hmm. That guy having confidence in who he was when he walked into that bar and saw a pretty girl over there and goes, you know what? I'm going to go say hi to her. That's what got him from A to B to C is having confidence. Mm -hmm. So, Well, I think you just narrowed it down and everything that we just talked about. That's perfect. Because that's a decision-making process, being able to fast identify the cost-benefit analysis and make the right decision for you subjectively, right? And owning that fact of it. I, I think that that's when we start talking about, you know, what's the difference between the people who actually get to live an authentic, you know, happy, balanced life, you know? Because I, I know people who are successful who are unhappy. I know just miserable fucking human beings. What is success, yeah. though? Well, that's the whole thing. Success is subjective. Success, mm -hmm. success has to be defined by you. You mm -hmm. set your success criteria in each area of your life, right? And that bar is only set by you and met by you. And you own that. And that's what success is. But it can't be the other way around. No. You can't give, like, again, you can't give that power away to somebody else and your boss telling you exactly how you have to be. And that's the only way you can be happy. Or putting a number on a scale if you're trying to lose weight. And the only way I can be happy is I'm a certain number. No. It Do has to be in source. Dollar number in your bank account. It doesn't, it does not work like that. So, yeah, I totally agree with you. Well, Nick, where can, where can people find you on, uh, where's your shop at, Instagram, <laughs> Facebook, website? You guys can find me, just Google search Fuzzy Nates. Um, I am on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm located in South Salt Lake. Um, i am come up in the top five Google searches for barbershops in Salt Lake, so I'm not hard to find. Um, you can text me if you want. My number is 801-828-5171. My shop address currently is 2212 South West Temple, Suite 17, soon to be the same address, Suite 41. Um, text me, make an appointment. Or just go on his freaking Instagram because it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my social media, I post what I want to post. Uh, and if I, if I piss you off, I'm not going to apologize because yeah. you're not the person I want following me. Uh, grow, grow some thicker skin, that's all i got to say. <laughs> See, this is exactly why I wanted you on this podcast for that exact reason right there. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Nick. Of course. Boom. That was an hour.